One glance at a painting may give us an impression of it, but working out how that impression was created can take some thought. Composition is the arrangement of shapes in the picture. This painting by the Italian Renaissance artist Piero della Francesca is carefully arranged to create a balanced but centered composition. The animation will show you what we think he had in mind. This tour continues on the next page when you are ready. Artists often organize their designs around flat forms, circles, triangles, and squares. But a skillful artist may also use a solid object, a cube, a sphere, or a cone. This example, by the Poleuolo brothers, is particularly striking, and was much admired by their contemporaries. The analysis button will show you what they did. Perspective creates an illusion of three-dimensional space on a two-dimensional surface. The simplest form of perspective makes all straight lines going away from the viewer meet at a single point on the horizon. In this example, the French artist Claude Lorraine has used a single point perspective system and created a unified space which stretches from the harbour to the horizon. Modern perspective systems were first worked out during the 15th century, in the period known as the Early Renaissance. The Italian artist Paolo Uccello applied the new science enthusiastically in works which are full of surprising effects. Uccello was particularly famous for the extreme lengths he went to to perfect his technique for depicting individual objects in perspective. The animations will show you two examples. Foreshortening is the aspect of perspective which deals with objects, especially parts of the body, pointing towards the viewer. Caravaggio, who painted this picture, specialized in works using foreshortening to create dramatic special effects. The animation will show you how it works. Perspective schemes often take account of where a painting will be hung. Sometimes a picture will only make sense when you look at it from the position the artist intended. Holbein's Ambassadors is a famous example which requires two very different points of view. The first is obvious, the second much more mysterious. This tour ends here. If you would like to find out more about the paintings we have discussed, choose one of the thumbnails on the right. To take another tour, choose Next Page. How are paintings made? This tour takes a look at some of the paintings in the National Gallery to see what we can find out about artists' working methods. We begin in an artist's studio. The painting shows St. Luke, depicted as a 16th century Netherlandish artist, holding a palette and a set of brushes. On the stool to his left, there is a mussel shell containing freshly mixed paint. All his equipment is recognisable today. This tour will continue when you are ready on the next page.
Roger van der Weyden, who painted this picture, trained, as all artists did, with a master whom he served for five years as an apprentice. This painting probably dates from just after that time, but it is only a fragment from a larger work. On the next page we will find out more about our painting and how others like it were made. Artists often drew full-sized designs on paper in preparation for their paintings. In many cases, they copied each other's work. Perceptive researchers have matched our fragment to two others and to this preparatory drawing for another work by a different artist. Renaissance painters often followed more than one profession. In this St. Sebastian, the Polaiuolo brothers who painted it appear to have made use of their skill as sculptors to help with the design. The animation shows how a small statue could have been used as a model for figures in the painting. Mantegna, another Italian Renaissance artist, was one of the first to try to recreate classical customs and costumes accurately. He based his work on careful study of ancient carvings and other remains of antiquity. Greek and Roman civilization was not the only thing he studied, as we will see on the next page. The figures are also a study of the human figure in motion made long before any modern scientific aids. The animation shows a sequence by the 19th century photographer Edward Mybridge which can be directly compared with the poses of the two bearers on the left of the painting. An unfinished painting can provide much information about an artist's working methods. Revered throughout Europe, Michelangelo was nevertheless notorious for not finishing his commissions. This altarpiece is an example. On the next page, we will see what we can find out about how he painted it. Michelangelo's painting method is traditional. Beginning with a specially prepared wooden panel, he has drawn his design and then painted the work in stages, beginning with the landscape. Before drawing his design on the panel, Michelangelo worked out the poses for his figures in preliminary, small-scale drawings. Once an artist had perfected a particular pose or mastered a special group of figures, he might reuse it from picture to picture. This example by the French artist Poussin shows a particularly striking case. The animation will show you how the upper painting quotes from the earlier one below. Turner's painting of the fighting Temeraire brings us into the 19th century. On the next page we have a closer look at some aspects of the way he painted it. A hostile critic called Turner's paintings pictures of nothing. But not everyone had such a low opinion. The critic Ruskin tells us something about how the painting was put together. Turner's painting was described as coloured steam which is exactly what Monet is showing us here. He painted much of this picture in a Paris railway station, next to the tracks. Painting outdoors in front of the subject was a modern development. Monet was developing new ways to represent the rapidly changing effects of natural light. Although sharing the Impressionist's interest in colour, Seurat returned to the carefully planned picture-making of earlier times. 
For a large canvas like this, he made many figure studies and oil sketches before returning to the studio to make the painting. On the next page, we take a closer look at his painting technique. Seurat developed a technique known as pointillism, in which he used dots of complementary colours to create a vibrant, luminous effect. Only a few parts of this picture employ the pointillist technique, although later he used it much more extensively. The animation gives you a closer look at how it works. This tour ends here. If you would like to find out more about the paintings we have discussed, choose one of the thumbnails on the right. To take another tour, choose next page. In a modern world of mass-produced reproductions, it's easy to forget that a painting is more than the image on its surface. Many of the paintings in the National Gallery are actually pieces of religious furniture. Small portable altarpieces like this were made to open and close so they could be transported and set up in different places. Try the close button to see how it worked. Choose next page to find out more about altarpieces and paintings as objects. Altarpieces were placed at the back of an altar to provide the setting for celebration of a Christian Mass. Here is another example, this time from Northern Europe. Larger folding altarpieces were also made for permanent installation in churches. The most complicated examples had many hinges and could be opened to display different combinations of images. Whether on many panels or one, large altarpieces such as this were commissioned for specific locations in a particular church building. This one comes from a church in Venice. The painting has been cut to a new shape. When the church authorities changed the architecture of the altar, many years after the original installation, they had the altarpiece cut to fit. The reconstruction shows what it probably looked like before. Uccello's painting of the Battle of San Romano is one in a set of three commissioned by Florence's Medici rulers for a room in their palace. When they reorganised their living arrangements, the artist altered the paintings accordingly. The button marked with arch shows a reconstruction of the earlier format. Titian's Bacchus and Ariadne was also painted for a specific setting. Alfonso d'Este commissioned it as one of a series of works, all based on a theme from classical literature. The animation shows a reconstruction of the complete installation. Rubens painted this view of the country round his manor, Het Steen, for his own collection. Like many of his paintings, it grew in size as he worked on it. The animation will show you how the work was put together. Whereas Rubens's canvas grew as he worked on it, this small picture has been assembled from pieces of a larger one. On the next page, we will see how. Fine detective work in the conservation studio shows how the painting was originally constructed.
This tour ends here. If you would like to find out more about the paintings we have discussed, choose one of the thumbnails on the right. To take another tour, choose Next Page. In this tour, we take a look at some discoveries made at the National Gallery, applying modern technology to look beneath the varnish of paintings in the collection. This large altarpiece from a church in Venice was stored in a cellar and became submerged in salt water during a flood. When it arrived at the National Gallery, the painting was in poor condition. The animation will show you the painting before and after restoration. The tour continues when you are ready on the next page. Paintings are often varnished to protect the paint and add brilliance to the colours. But varnish turns yellow with age, so conservators usually remove the old varnish at an early stage of cleaning a picture. In the case of this painting by Giovanni Bellini, they found that previous owners had had it altered. The animation will show you what they found. People in the past have not always treated their paintings with the respect we show them now. The animation shows how someone has added details to this painting by Leonardo da Vinci. Museums now use X-ray machines, originally developed for medicine and metallurgy, for scientific investigation of paintings. In this case, the X-ray shows how the artist, Tura, changed his mind, painting a second figure over the top of his own original. According to legend, Jan van Eyck invented oil painting. This is not strictly true, but he was one of the earliest to exploit its full potential. His paintings are exceedingly rare and closely studied for clues to the way he worked. On the next page, we take a closer look beneath the paint. Infrared photography, like X-rays, reveals aspects of a work of art not visible to the naked eye. In this case, the scientists have used infrared to look through the layers of paint to see Van Eyck's design, revealing the way in which he modified it while he worked. Not all the changes made by artists to their paintings relate to purely artistic considerations. Wellington sat for his portrait by Goya at a particularly eventful time in his life. On the next page, we can see how Goya changed the painting to keep up with the Duke's career. The animation shows how the painting changed. This tour ends here. If you would like to find out more about the paintings we have discussed, choose one of the thumbnails on the right. To take another tour, choose Next Page.